Hello, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon, Identifying and Reaching Your Target Market. My name is Rick Van Branken. I'm a county agricultural agent here at Rutgers University, a Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Atlanta County specifically. I've been there for about 30 years, and I've always had this issue uh, with growers asking me about marketing their produce. And because they're, they're fairly professional growers, they work really hard, they can grow just about anything that you hand them, but they always come up with a question, how do I market it? So I've spent the last 10 or 15 years putting together some columns for the American vegetable grower, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, Marketing Matters is my column in the American Vegetable Growers where I write a little bit on the topic of marketing. Ah, life on the farm. If I grow it, they will come. And yes, we grow big acreage of uh, lettuce here in New Jersey and other crops, planting wall to wall, and uh, we hope that the growers will come. But the other question is, won't they? Well, it's not your grandparents' farm anymore. We're marketing produce, or are we producing for your market? It's really a key question because you need to know if you are finding your market or if you're reaching your target market. So if you do ask if they grow it and they will come, you can only answer that if you are answering who are they. And that's what we're going to try to work on this afternoon is to decide how to know your market, um, which people have written about in the past and called it the most challenging part of a business plan. Can you tell me how to find customers for my product? How much can I expect them to buy? If I'm writing a business plan, those are the key questions and some of the most challenging uh, that you'll get from people working in the field and new farmers coming in to try to develop a business plan. Well, why is it that you want to know who they are and what they want? Well, just think about if you were going to go into the pepper business and you think you're going to grow some, uh, whether you want to stick with a single one or you want to have a variety, you realize there's a lot of different types of peppers out there around the world. Some are hot, some are hotter, and there are some folks that like that taste of a habanero pepper, that sweet, smoky flavor, uh, but a lot of folks don't like the heat. Well, there are peppers out there that have that sweet habanero flavor, smoky habanero flavor, but they don't like the heat. They don't have any heat. So you can grow an ahi dulce, which means literally sugar pepper. Uh, they also call it spice pepper in some of the trade literature. So have you asked those folks that you think you're going to sell to which they like? You might also figure out uh, you don't want to grow some jalapenos. Well, jalapenos are notorious for having some marks on them, checking, we call it, uh, or growth cracks. And if you were to try to grow them for the traditional American marketplace, Americans have been conditioned, spoiled, per se, into wanting blemish-free produce. And so they go to the supermarket and they find a pepper with little brown growth cracks all over it. They don't like it. They don't uh, buy it. But if you're in the middle of a Mexican market and you go there with perfectly blemish-free produce, uh, the Mexicans won't buy it because they're used to in their culture that uh, the ones with the cracks are the tastier ones. We did some work on it a few years ago and found out there's really no correlation between growth cracking and heat, even though some of the Mexican consumers claim that uh, the cracked ones are hotter. It's more of a varietal issue, but it is a cultural favorite that is different in each group. And why do we do that? Well, the number one rule in marketing any product, any crop, is give the consumer what he or she wants. And once you know what he or she wants, then you're able to grow the right crop, harvest it at the correct stage, package it appropriately for their needs, and avoid costly mistakes. If you keep your buyer happy, you're going to make money. Well, to answer all that, who they are, it all depends where you think you're going to be the food chain. From farm to plate, there's a lot of different variations on where you can send your product. 
If you're going directly to consumer, there's a lot of options that in that direct marketing agritourism area. On the other hand, if you're getting into the wholesale market, you may be able to go directly to a retail store, but there are many other alternatives as well. So the answering of that, who they are and what they want, it changes whether your customers are directly buying from you at a community farmer's market. CSA participants may have a completely different outlook on what their product should look and taste like. Wholesale shipper buyers, you know, there's a crew that would keep you uh, scratching your head because every one of them has a dis different customer and a different need for the product that they're using. Terminal commission markets. Terminal markets uh, are notorious for having almost being dumping grounds, but uh, if you work with the merchant buyers there, they will sell your produce and treat you well. But they have different needs. They are supplying different customers than some of the wholesale shippers. In between all of them, there are distributors of all sizes, shapes, and kinds, and they may be focused on particular areas, geographic areas. They may have particular products. Uh, we've been working a lot with ethnic distributors that service only a certain part of the marketplace. And there's, there's several different types of distributors out there and sizes. And if you're lucky, you could go uh, with the current trend in local uh, marketing. Many of the retail grocers are making direct contacts with growers these days. They want to have a farmer's face in their marketplace as well. So how do we go about targeting our market? Well, you've got to research it. There are a couple of different layers of research. And primary research is basically just asking. If you canvass the neighborhood, if you're planning on putting up a farm stand or going to the, the uh, farmer's market, go there. Talk to the customers that are frequenting the market. Go ask your neighbors, canvass the neighborhood. You can also get a little more formal, formal and send out surveys. If you plan to go to the community market, uh, visit them. Uh, look at markets, look at trade shows, go to different events. Also, don't ignore the trade publications. They will tell you what different, especially on the wholesale side, uh, they can tell you what buyers in different regions are looking for. And food magazines are great for identifying new trends, whether it be something like the interest in local, the interest in gourmet products, unusual products, or ethnic type of uh, materials. Then there's secondary research. That's digging into the data, and there are a few different places that you would go to do that. The biggest database that's going to tell you about your market potential is the U.S. Census. There's a lot of information there. It takes some work to dig it out. A few folks in Extension and other places have worked up some tools to help you dig that out a little bit easier but uh, or more easily, but uh, uh, still, it's, it's a little bit of work to find it. You could always pay for a market analysis. Sometimes our extension folks aren't market oriented and uh, they won't be able to help you. Some are and, and will be able to. Alternatively, the folks in your county municipal planning and economic development offices or even the Better Business Bureau may be able to assist you in, in digging through that data. There's a question. Today, with delivery systems in place that allow you to overnight package and ship things around the world, it's a whole lot easier to do mail order than it used to be. We also have packaging technology, so there are easily obtainable products like styrofoam coolers, styrofoam shipping crates that allow you to pack produce and put ice or some other refrigerant in there to keep the product cool and fresh. So mail order is available. Uh, it is changed over the years, partially in the delivery manner, but also in the order taking. It's not as much people calling up or ordering via a, a newsletter or some other written material, but there's a lot of mail order of produce right now going on online. You can set up an entire order form on your uh, website, and it can be done. So mail order still is around. It's not as prolific as it used to be. I grew up in an area in upstate New York where there were a couple of growers who actually made their livelihood and kept the farm in business by going into the mail order business. And, and it's still around. 
So if we're going to start asking questions, what are we going to ask? We can talk to consumers, and the types of questions you want to ask them about are how much do they normally buy, how frequently do they shop for that item, would they prefer any special attributes like local or organic or IPM, and would they pay a premium for those type of products. Where do they shop now? Figure out who your competition is because you need to know if you're going to be able to uh, create something new and better that will attract them to shop at your place rather than the competition down the street. Do they prefer to visit a farm or a community farmer's market or a retail market or have it delivered? There's uh, delivery routes. Uh, many CSAs now take product door-to-door, -door, and even the retail marketers are working on online orders and door-to-door -door delivery. And how far are they willing to come if they're to drive if they're going to go to your farm market to buy their product? And what else could you do to entice them to buy your product? Those, that's a short list. There are probably other questions you could ask, but certainly that's a good starting point. Is there another question I see? Kitchen facilities would only be needed if you're going to process the product into additional added value. As far as I know, just putting it into a shipping crate that is ready for mail order, putting in the mail or FedExing it would be no different than standard packaging that you can do on any farm. It's, it's only when you start chopping it up or cooking it or doing something different to it, an additional value-added process. The only caveat to all that is you should always check with your local health department to make sure they're treating it the same way, looking at it the same way as we do from the agricultural side. The other side of Ask Red, if you're trying to go to the wholesale market, again, this is a matter of sitting down on the phone or going in person and talking to potential buyers, whether it be at the retail warehouse, uh, at a local distributor, or at a wholesale buyer shipper. Talk to them about how much volume they would use. When they would want it, if there are any particular varieties that they need or want to use, what type of packaging is required? And will they require some sort of food safety plan or certification? And if so, uh, which is more and more likely, which kind would be sufficient for them? A harmonized versus a, uh, one of the commercial ones that are out there. You need to know which one to be geared up for. What price range would they expect to pay? Would they pay premiums for things like local organic or IPN? Again, a short list. Uh, there's probably other questions that could be asked, but um, that's a place to get started. Now, one of the things that we're driving towards is if you are starting a new business or a new enterprise is adding a market analysis to your business and marketing plan. The market analysis describes the product or service, the estimated size of that market in terms of volume, the segment of the market you expect to serve and the geographic area where you're going to go. That's all a part of the who they are that we're trying to answer. Another question. That all depends on the packaging and how fast and frequently you need to ship it. Certainly fresh fruits and vegetables and even fresh herbs are going to require more cold, retentive packaging, but if you're shipping it overnight, it can be done. On the other hand, uh, dried herbs and spices have a shelf life that, uh, and it doesn't require cold packaging, and so that uh, can be done more readily, and, and there's not a big a rush on getting that product out the door to meet the FedEx pickup at uh, a certain time. So yes, uh, the, it, it all depends on what your target market is looking for again. Depending on who you're talking to, you can sometimes differentiate, and at least if you label your product IPM, the consumer will have a little bit higher expectation that it's uh, that the farmer is uh, being re more resourceful, and that may be an added value that they're willing to pay for. Again, it's it's a matter of convincing the consumer that the product is somehow different than 
what their concept is of conventional. Okay, let's see if we can dig into some of this data and show you uh, a little bit about how we can find out who they are. The U.S. Census has a couple of different data sets that they've put into formats that are easily accessible. The easiest place is to go to uscensus.gov and look up state and county quick facts. Those quick facts, uh, then you uh, select your state. We've looked at New Jersey here, and it will compare New Jersey's population between the state and the national population. You can then go down further and dig into the data and see the percentage of ethnic makeups. These quick facts do take a little bit of getting used to. The ethnic breakdown or racial breakdown is based on percentage, so you've got to do some calculating to get the actual numbers. It also goes into the top or the big five race distinctions as opposed to individual ethnic groups or uh, ethnic backgrounds. When you go to the next level down, you can go from state to county, find that county data changes uh, dramatically depending on where you are uh, in the state. And similarly, uh, you can dig down further into that information about income levels, education levels, you know a little bit more about the background of your potential customers. And then you can dig down even further and go to individual cities and find the town that you're living in. Hamilton, New Jersey, prides itself on being uh, the most Italian city in the state. That type of information is not going to come up under the city and county quick facts. You have to get to know some of the other spots in the census in order to find that. Another question coming up. Well, there are a number of ways uh, you may do it based on the product itself. Are you offering something different than your neighborhood? Are you offering services that your neighboring markets are not offering? Are you adding some value somehow, whether it be customer service, whether you're making pies and jams and jellies from the products that you have versus your neighbor just offering fresh product? All of those things are a means of differentiating yourself. It may be based on location. It may be based on the product. Again, there's lots and lots of ways to differentiate yourself. And, and that, again, could be something to base uh, your market research on when you are asking the cons potential consumers where they shop now, ask them what they like and what they don't like about that, uh, ask them what products they don't have that you could offer, ask them what services that uh, they would like to see. That's all part of differentiating yourself from the competition. I threw this slide in here and, and another one uh, just to show you that um, if you are thinking that you have quite a diversity of ethnic populations in your community, you can dig these numbers out of the, the census figures. We started with these a few years ago, and this is an update uh, when, after the 2010 census came out. It takes a little bit of time and effort uh, to calculate these, but you can see that the populations on the left-hand column show that uh, there are quite a number of different Asian and Hispanic groups, and within each group there are different sizes of those populations. There's a lot of news and, and discussion about uh, the Mexican population that is growing tremendously throughout the country these days. But here in the Northeast, you can see that uh, the Mexican population is, even though it grew three times faster than the Puerto Rican population in the last 10 years, it's still less than half of the Puerto Rican population in the Northeast. So you really need to understand those differences when you're developing your markets. This is another way of looking at it, and this shows you how each state is, the diversity of each state or which ethnic group makes up the different proportions within each state of those ethnic populations. Another question? And that answer is yes. The research has shown that the second generation 
tends to take less than six years to go from ethnic food choices to American food choices. So that's another question to ask of your potential consumers. Are they uh, recent immigrants? Are they uh, foreign born? Uh, or are they second, third, fourth generation? Uh, because that will certainly affect how they view some of the ethnic food choices if you want to try to grow some of those products. The next slide shows what one of my partners at the New Jersey Ag Experiment Station Food Policy Institute has been able to do, digging through parts of the census similar to what I did on the previous couple of slides, but he was able to take it down to the census track, which is individual zip codes, and taking a look at if you search for ancestry rather than race or ethnic group, in the census, you will find uh, some of this data and you can extrapolate from there. This is going to help you determine a question like, what kind of hot pepper should I grow? Should I grow those Jamaican habaneros or scotch bonnets if I'm living in Cherry Hill, which is where the red circle is? Well, you might be better off if you can grow some Asian hot peppers for the Korean market rather than the Jamaican peppers. On the other hand, if you're living up in the upper northeast to the upper right-hand corner closer to New York City, there you have a much larger concentration of Jamaican residents versus the Koreans. So that, uh, that can determine, your location can determine what type of crops you're going to concentrate on. Of course, you may want to address both of them and, and or travel to a farm market in either location. If you're traveling, is it worth taking your Jamaican hot peppers to Cherry Hill, uh, or would you take those north and then go south for the, the Asian peppers? A pepper question, good. That comes from India, and there are some Indian sects that really do like hot, very hot uh, peppers. There's also many communities in many ethnic groups or countries in Africa where they like extremely hot peppers, and some of those in Southeast Asia. The race now to find the hottest pepper is, is jumped between India's ghost pepper and the Thai scorpion pepper, so there are people out there that are doing their best. On the other hand, those ghost peppers, the Indian government's also looking at them to develop into tear gas type uh, materials. So be very careful when you start playing with this. You've identified the potential groups that live in your area and you want to find out more about them. That's where some of the work that we've been doing here at Rutgers, collaboration with our friends in, in the University of Massachusetts and Cornell, with support from the USDA SARE, Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, and some risk management agency money. We put together the World Crops website, worldcrops.org, and this site is developed based on the countries of the world. So if you find that you have a lot of Jamaicans, or in this case, we use the example of Brazilians. You can go to the map of the Americas. You can then select on Brazil. You can read about the people of Brazil, the types of food they like. Included in that is a list of common crops that Brazilians will grow and eat. So let's take a look. There's a lot of unfamiliar names there, so you might pick Gilo. Gilo, turns out, is just a type of eggplant, and we can link into production information on eggplant. The biggest challenge on most of these is finding a reliable seed source, and sometimes it takes, unfortunately, too often it takes some folks sneaking some seed in to get a reliable source. But Gilo is uh, a common and very prolific eggplant that Brazilian consumers like. There's another website out there. This got started at the University of Illinois about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. They have been slowly expanding it and, and uh, coaxing other states to join them. The ones in orange in this picture are the states that currently participate in the National Market Maker Program. I've tried my best to get my colleagues in New Jersey to join in because we have a terrific market outlet here, but the cost and some other issues during these tight budget times have kept us from participating. 
But what this system does is allow you to go in and, of course, it's, it's open. You can ex access it even if you're not in a participating state, which is helpful for those states where there are, you might be a neighbor and be able to utilize some of the information that's in there. It will bring up food preferences based on the state's population. It has a link to the primary census data about uh, the state. You can go down to the county and municipal level on these as well. You can also then search for other businesses. You can look at the food preferences. Um, once you find out, uh, you can look for businesses such as fruit and uh, vegetable wholesalers. Uh, this one happens to be a farm, Golden Harvest Farms, and you can click on it and it will link and uh, show you the products uh, that they would be willing to buy. So if you're searching for your potential buyers, this is uh, on the wholesale side, this would be one way to go for it. You can also go into the find a business section if you're looking for specific wholesalers. Say you are in a region, you can put in a wholesaler, and you can then get a selection of the different types of wholesalers and narrow it down. We'll look for fruit and vegetable growers. And once you select that, you can put in your zip code. I happened to grow up in uh, upstate New York where that red star is and thought about going into the vegetable business a few years ago. If I go on here to find out where my potential customers are, I find my wholesalers within 50 miles. Uh, there are a few of them concentrated in the big me metropolitan areas, Albany, Troy, and some further west but I may not be able to serve them too well. I also worked a few years ago with my 4-H agent in helping develop the Saratoga Farmers Market, and let's see if that has some uh, potential. The uh, Saratoga Farmers Market has lots more competition these days. There are about 50 different farmers markets around my site and certainly closer. So if you click on the Saratoga Farmers Market, it will bring up their information, how to contact them, email and uh, phone numbers, who to contact. It also gives you a direct link to their website. So you can go and visit them, talk to your uh, potential customers there. So once you've identified your potential consumers, and another question. That depends on the market and the town in which they're located. There's a group of markets, especially in North Jersey, that have formed more or less an alliance, and they are extremely strict on the growers producing anything they sell and only having a limited, a very limited amount of product that they purchase from their neighboring farmers. And they actually have somebody that goes around and enforces that inspects the farms and make sure they are growing what they're growing. There are other markets, they, they call themselves farmers markets, and oftentimes you go there, you, if you dig hard enough and ask enough questions, you'll find out that the person selling there is not even a farmer, but a uh, what we call a huckster who buys, and it may be local product, it may be that he went to a local terminal market and bought some product uh, and is selling it there as a farmer. So it all depends on the market. You need to talk to the market managers and, and or the municipality to find out what the rules are for each particular market. But it's not uniform across the state. So once we've identified our potential consumers and asked them what they wanted, what they want, what you can sell, then it's a matter of reaching them. How do you reach your target market? Just like in finding out what they want, you've now got to communicate with them how your product is going to be their best option. Initially, you can do word of mouth, and word of mouth these days, if you can get something on the internet to go viral, use it. Uh, direct mail still works, Post postcards, newsletters, people still like to get a little friendly reminder that you're out there in the form of a newsletter. All your merchandising, the signs on and off your property, the packaging, the displays, the signs that uh, mark what your products are, all of those are means of communicating with your customers. And then there's the outreach to try to get to the folks, get new folks in, traditional media, classified ads, newspaper ads, radio, television, they still work. 
they're expensive. It depends on what your budget will allow. On the other hand, social media, it's a matter of gathering an email clientele, uh, gathering email addresses and sending them out to regular communications, creating a website, blogging, all of those things can be used to reach your target market. One of the best marketers, uh, farm marketers in the state, Matty Matarazzo, is a media wizard. He's wrote a book years ago, Marketing for Success. It's still in limited availability, but you can find some copies out there. Marketing for Success, Creative Marketing Tools for the Ag Industry. This is basically guerrilla marketing for agriculture. He's a master of using the media to gain free publicity, and this is one of the biggest tools that he uses. He's got an album full of clippings, largely as a result of sending out regular news releases at least once a week. He actually has a person on staff that writes up new releases and sends them out. What does he say about it? You can spend thousands of dollars on advertising but in commercials and radio, but none of them give you the reward that a press release does, and that's credibility. People turn to you, the reporters turn to you when they need a source of information, whether they need a comment about a, an issue that they're researching, or whether they want to know about what's in season. Making contact with those folks is an important part of a marketing process, and the outreach uh, tool is critical. The modern version of this that I've been talking about recently is not only do you want to talk to your local newspaper reporter, but you also want to get in line with some food bloggers. That's a new age social media way to get your word out. We had a recent example of this. We wrote a local reporter call to talk about the Jersey tomato and what we're doing to improve it and bring back that good old time flavor. It, the article ended with a discussion by a local food blogger who then commented that while the New Jersey is, uh, tomato is great in season, they still love to have a Florida tomato in the wintertime uh, when they can't get local Jersey cropped. Turns out she's actually working for the Florida Tomato Commission on the side. So making those contacts with food bloggers can give you an important in as the Tomato Florida Commission almost co-opted our Jersey tomato article. Email outreach uh, these days, you can do it on your own. You can gather those emails, but you can also use a number of different services that are out there. The Greater Vineland Chamber of Commerce likes to celebrate our dandelion crop every year. They've gone to email marketing, and what they've done is work with constant contact. You hear them advertising all the time on different radio stations on their outreach. There are a number of other email services that will let you do the same thing. The other great thing about these is there's always a forward email link, so if your subscribers get this news and like it, they can forward it to their friends as well. And don't forget to ask them to do that when they're in the body of your email communications. So we're going to target your customers. We need to find them. That's a matter of doing primary research, ask visit the community, read about them and what they read. That's secondary research. It may take time and effort, but digging into the U.S. Census, some tools out there to make it a little easier, the market maker and worldcrops.org are a couple. Then you need to also reach them. Communicate and advertise using a word of mouth, direct mail, merchandising, all the traditional media and more and more social media these days. These are all tools to target your customer Finding them and reaching them is what you need to do before you start planting a single crop. Again, I mentioned before I do a national uh, column in the American Vegetable Grower magazine. If you're not a subscriber to that magazine, you can go online to their website at growingproduce.com and search for either my name or Marketing Matters, and you'll find my musings there. It was interesting that when I started doing the research for this presentation and I decided to, to create a column out of it as well, looking for that quote from Field of Dreams, which is, if you build it, he will come. I guess there's some other folks that think of it in marketing terms too. If you build it, will they come is a recent book that I found uh, when searching. 
I haven't uh, had a chance to read it yet, but I suspect it could be some useful tools in there as well. That basically concludes our presentation, identifying and reaching your target market. Yep, one question before we sign off. I haven't done that part of the research. Most of the time, in, in a couple of different places, the comments were most of this research doesn't get done formally. It gets done unless you're in the process of putting together a, an application either for a loan or some other business assistance through USDA. But it depends on what those folks are going to want versus what information you need to find out to make some decisions on how to proceed in your business planning. Okay, thank you all.